to self indulgence that is the somatica live stream three times a week i'm supposed to indulge myself with live streaming various things um and in my thursday slots it's the movement organizing theme perhaps the most broadly interesting thing to somatic educators out there like feldenkrais practitioners um such as myself uh but in the tuesday and wednesday slots i more or less uh, continue to review um, my interests in the natural sciences um, specifically the educational materials in those areas um and broadly broadly varying things in those time slots today i'm um going to very much catch up on Murray Bookchin. Um, you can enter Google, sorry, you can enter Murray Bookchin into your, your uh, search engine of interest. Don't need to necessarily G word. Murray Bookchin. Here's Murray Bookchin at the Anarchist Library. Some nice resources. Very influential figure on the left. You can see a lot of this writing is uh, from the last 10 years. <clears throat> or published quite recently. Um, But um, some okay, right. So I know that I know that this should be much older than two thousand nine, right? This this is from from nineteen seventy one actually. Um, so what I know about Murray Bookchin is that, um, well, something a fair fair bit in common I would say with Moshe Feldenkrais in terms of cultural background, um, and. Uh, was as a younger person very interested in um, Marxism and didn't just have an academic um, interest in it, um, but a very active particip participatory interest in um, organizing um, the United States towards um, a communist revolution. Uh, so that was young, young Murray Bookchin um and at some point um has a, a turn away from the marxist tradition um this essay i think is a fairly famous one says so a fairly long time ago but chin turns away from marxism that's 1971. um um i i don't know that this actually is an accurate date for when book chin turns away from marxism um but it definitely um moves to anarchism um as a, a political ideology that again um this person very actively organizes towards um their kind of ideal society um and so this is published 1982 so sometime after listen marxist and is considered one of the major works of um of this person um one of their major contributions and also um i think where social ecology really gets laid out as a um, sort of cohesively um and so we have the concept of social ecology, the outlook of organic society, um, and the idea of hierarchy as um, a social um, a social phenomena that is partially natural. Um, and so, um, rather than proposing a society without any hierarchy at all, um, as is kind of the anarchist utopian um thing that Bookchin is working towards social ecology um 
focuses more on on the anti-democratic and exploitative aspects of hierarchy that are the actual essences of both the Marxist and the crit- and the anarchist uh, criticisms of um, uh, mainstream society, society that's been the dominant the dominant um, colonizing imperial force on on the earth. So whether you're living under it as Marx type people were, or with it, I guess you could also say because Marx is an interesting character, um, or or fully s- subjugated by it, like a like a person um, under transatlantic uh, slavery. Um, uh, that whole that whole that whole project, nonetheless is this um this thing that's in dialogue here this philosophical tradition is in dialogue with with that political um organism you could say or body of cultural technology okay so yeah i was just taking a survey here um i guess i wanted to pin down what he was saying exactly this actually bit on i realized why i was down on hierarchy one second Need to look at this. Yeah, so this has um, a fairly cartoonish picture of um, anthropology um, that uh, David Graeber types have recently made fun of, but I guess uh, everyone makes fun of from within the indigenous traditions and um, or many indigenous traditions anyway. Um, So nonetheless, working with that that very Eurocentric and you could say um, male centric or war centric um, model of uh, human development, um, Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age. kind of story. So here, this connects to one of the kind of research goals of today was finding finding actual things that Bookchin sang on on nature and uh, the distinction between the human and and the natural world. Um, I think uh, I think I'll I'll pause there. Gather some thoughts again. Check in to see if anyone's interacting with me on these here platforms that this is streaming to. But also um, comment on um, how much this matters to me in my day-to-day work as a as a Feldenkrais practitioner. Um, it's not in, uncommon to have people coming to me and framing things in terms of, is this natural what's happening to me? Um, as if um, I can really adju- adjudicate if something to them, if something is happening to them that's natural versus like supernatural or like natural versus um, something 
corrupted by artificial means is usually it's a quite an often um, a popular way of framing things that a person feels like their state has been corrupted through the intervention of others and so something's unnatural has occurred to them and and that's that's the framing of it and as a um a natural scientist as a person with a quite an interest in the natural world and um also helping people thrive um helping myself thrive um it's uh a disheartening thing for me when people are, are mud, muddled in that dichotomy because I can see that it's a false dichotomy. That in a large sense, we are, we are the natural world. And the distinction between us and the natural world, it isn't adaptive in itself. It's not, it's not helpful. Or if it is adaptive, it's culturally adaptive and allows for um humans to have um this great cultural techno set of cultural technologies um compared to most animals these these adaptations that let us use language and abstract thinking to move ourselves forward in time with a, an ever accelerating body of knowledge um what is Korzybski? Korzybski calls it uh, time binding. I think he calls it time binding. This this idea that we ratchet forward in time um, based on accumulating um, what we know. It's beautiful if that story doesn't come at the expense of feeding a machine that actually destroys things and rich bodies of knowledge that are different. And that's the... I guess the thing people want scientists to hear is that in the pursuit of their own careers or their own, you know, findings that that they don't destroy more accumulated knowledge or wisdom than they're actually finding. Prioritizing some kind of quality of the information, one quality over another. And it's a very human thing to do. I can almost fall prey to it myself. I, I think actually, even today, if you said, here's the like solution to the energy crisis, like, you know, it fits in a shoebox and you can mass produce it without any significant footprint and it solves it and it makes all the energy you need. So every car, every home, every factory can have a, an energy source and the energy crisis is now over, you know. So that, that or, you know, extinguish um, a whole species, extinct a whole species from, from the biosphere, the amount of accumulated wisdom just in, in that lineage. Um, and you know, I had to weigh those two things. Um, yeah, I would probably, I'd probably solve the energy crisis and think, think, you know, anything like stop civilization from this, uh, um, civilization, anything that stops humanity as we know it, um, from, uh, careening off the, off the cliff into the abyss with this uh, pursuit of particular qualities of information, particular things. Um, yeah, anything which makes makes that death machine less deathly or stop, you know, seems like the right thing to do, even if it causes an extinction event. Um, and that's from the perspective of preserving all life. It's that bleak. It's that bleak. But... I guess the story of life has always had a little bit of creative destruction in it. Um, I mean, the two major innovations are really death and sex, and both of them seem to be invented 
more or less for creative destruction. You could say sex is more neutral creativity. But it's at the expense of productivity. And it also, yes, it also creates detrimental results. If you just wanted to optimize, you wouldn't need sex. You would just need death. The cells could reproduce and reproduce and randomly vary and get selected for whatever whatever they need to get selected for. But yeah, that selection part wouldn't happen without death. So that's an important part of the whole process. I'm saying all of this because I think it all needs to be brought in, reined in, factored in. It would be nice if this could just automatically fit in the box. And, uh, why would it assume 62 point? It's just not very convenient. So these are quotes from the Ecology of Freedom. Is this actually in in enough context? I mean, no, this isn't at all. I'm 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 just murdering. Bookchin doesn't think this the, themselves. Literally, I don't know why I'm pasting it in here like it's that salient of a quote. But I can I can collect the quotes here. I need to read this in context, obviously. All right, back to this emergence of hierarchy was where I was. Picking this up. And that was Proudhorn. Proudhorn says that. And this is also this relationship, almost an adversarial relationship with nature. Right. So that's actually the more the organic kind of Marxist perspective. Because, yeah, Bookchin's all about post-scarcity. Bookchin's all about the idea that um, we're not actually locked into this struggle with uh, nature in, in some, some deep way. Um, so, yeah, that reminds me of um, an, an essay, which I need, to, I need to also, yeah, address sometimes. Transhumanism as a... As a, it's transhumanism, or I think like a foil of transhumanism is coming out quite a bit nowadays. Um,
It's good. Did I have even Bookchin cartooned right on hierarchy? Okay, I think researching this live is probably not going to be that easy. It's funny, even skimming this text on camera doesn't go as easily. Far out. So, yeah, concluding with um, we need to re entry into a natural evolution. Um, obviously, a, a text worth a reading, um, people, people like me that are just uh, piecemealing it and uh, dismembering it for their own interests um, are uh, probably not serving it very well. But it's, uh, it's worth looking at. It's right here. Um, you can see it's easy to find. Um, Murray Bookchin. Um, so that's the actual thinking on um, social ecology specifically. Um, there's been... Yeah, the concept of two nature two natures. Here's a here's the thing trashing him as a Zionist. Who's Ben Norton? Who's trashing Murray Butchin? This hamburger menu doesn't do anything. Click, click. So anyway, yeah. Um, Murray Bookchin pretty much disavowed himself of anarchism proper. Um, so, yeah, social ecology, yeah, very much. This sounds like a fairly hostile writer already. Let's see here. Very soft on imperialism and sometimes apologetic. So from yeah eighty six, <laughs> okay. So yeah, he wrote he wrote in eighty six uh, when he's still pretty much a Marxist and very much like still believes in governments, state governments. So yeah, not great context. Ben Norton, I mean. Dropping this like uh, <laughs> it's not a great look, though, for sure. Indeed, the partition lines that were eventually established after the 1948 invasions were the product of bloody warfare, literally the give and take of battle, not of imperialistic or land grabbing Zionists, to use the language that is so much in vogue these days. Well, actually, yeah, that's, 
That is kind of true. The land grabbing was done through a very different means than the actual border, the actual war stuff. Anyway, I'm not even reading this thing holistically. But uh, yeah, 1986. All right. This is a fun uh, thing to read, uh, all this uh, sliding of, of Vukchen. I have no quarrel with libertarians who advance the concept of capitalism, Vukchen told the Koch Brothers Reason magazine. Let me make it very plain that if socialism, which is what I call the authoritarian version of collectivism, were to emerge, I would join your right-wing libertarian community. Okay, fine. Whether they're anarcho commun Communists, anarchist syndicalists, or libertarians who believe in free enterprise, I regard theirs as the real legacy of the left. I feel much closer ideologically to such individuals than I do the totalitarian liberals and Marxist Leninists of today. Yeah, so that sounds actually really anarchist. So, yeah, so what? <laughs> so what? Uh, Pat Norton. <laughs> uh, Oh, I see. So you think you think that 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 is the case because Bookchin's uh, easy on um, imperialism. Yeah, so this is interesting because he's talking about Syria and um, Ocalan, probably. So the 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 point that the Kurds in Rojava have been allied with Washington um <clears throat> is uh yeah that frequently comes up <clears throat> and uh I think it's safe to say that like everyone's tried to get something out of Rojava and the Kurds um But yeah, talking about the the yeah, this is a I don't disagree with this either. The um, kind of hyperfixation on the YP <laughs> yeah, excuse me the YPG. Right. Yeah. Well, I I don't I don't I still don't see any reason to trash book book chain because of this. <laughs> Like, if it's it's still true, if it's still true that Rojava is like over propagandized as a as a leftist utopia, um, it still is directly influenced by O'Connell's writing, who's directly influenced by Bookchin, and like you got to look at it as a real, imp you got to look at it for what it is. Um, it is a feminist and democratic society today compared to um, its birthing grounds. And yeah, this, this, no, nothing here actually engages with 
um, Okawan or 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 Bookchin. And yeah, I mean that point. That points. Uh, yeah, like if Noam Chomsky and David Graeber are like the leaders of the anarchists, then yeah, when they sign on to that that letter, it's not a good look. But they're they're not leaders of the anarch. Like, I just don't understand how you could think of Chomsky or Graeber as like imperialist. <laughs> I don't really understand. Like if they do something that's inconsistent with an anti-imperialist perspective, then you, you probably should try to interpret it holistically instead of saying, okay, this disproves that they're actually anti-imperialistic. And so, yeah, this is a big pro-military intervention thing by all, all these leftists sign on to. Gloria Steinem's an actual former CIA agent. It's pretty great. Might be good to get, get clear. Better better get that one clear. Sorry, everyone. We're going we're gonna to figure out if Gloria Steinem's actually uh, a spy, a CIA agent. Um, so anyway, continuing on with uh, how Marie Bookchin apparently, this is a fun rabbit hole for me, actually, like, um, because it, in a sense, it lets me engage the problem of um, the Zionist foundings of Feldenkrais method. Um, it lets me kind of play with that um, with a little bit more safe distance, because anyone that knows Marie Bookchin at all knows that it doesn't matter, like... Like Murray Bookchin was one of the most like vehemently, openly critical, like verbal sparring people around. Completely belongs to the tradition of just like hashing it out. Um, the the enlightenment, the enlightenment liberal kind of perspective um, of just rational free exchange from from parties is going to lead to something good happening. And so to the extent that nothing good happened, you know, it shows that this process doesn't work very well. But in the meantime, I'm here to process things and I'm not claim that I've got a, a fixed perspective or narrative anyway. Again, I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner. I'm also an Ashkenazi Jew. Um, I went through plenty of uh, Holocaust education and uh, Zionist education as a child. And so my current position of being um, non-Zionist, which I've, which I've had for um, some time, um, is, uh, hasn't been easy to, to develop for myself. Um, and uh, it's different than being anti-Zionist and it's different from being um, uh a self-loathing jew or something um so happy to engage all of that um but uh taking away from attacking a person as a hypocrite is um uh not a, not the strongest way to invalidate their ideas anyway anyway in 86 And and yeah, it, the person's identified as Marxist at that point. So the, yeah, I mean, Ben Norton's clearly got a, a hate on for for Murray Vuchin. That's that's especially strong, or maybe leftists in general. Um, but 
he's not he's not even identifying as an anarchist at this point. And yeah, it's completely right. It's a completely uh Yeah, there's some Zionist perspectives on uh, on the formation of Israel. That criticism sounds fine. Not not mentioning the Nakba. Murderous ethnic cleansing. And yeah, this is a. Uh, it's true that this is a very like mainstream, and not a. A, fair, a fairly propagandized Zionist perspective that book chins. Um, All right. So yeah, I'm done. This is a fairly embarrassing take uh from Murray Bookchin 1986. Here's a link to I think some funny claim from that article. I'm not going to follow up any further. Uh so yeah, at some point he was a Zionist. I don't think you can say he's a Zionist in general. Because he's not really a statist. Doesn't really believe in nation states. So. Been a conditional Zionist at, at best. Uh, um, so this two natures concept. First and second nature. First and second. Hey, look at this. Someone's got an essay I can read. <laughs> <coughs> I know I can find. I actually took a. I actually took a course of the institute. Institute. I didn't. I didn't participate very well in the course. But uh, yeah, I did a course here, which is uh, this is the institutional, I guess, footprint of uh, Murray Bookchin. It's actually founded. Yeah, incorporated in 1981. So this is Murray Bookchin's edifice, leftover, continuing its own organism. Um, Articles on domination of nature, domination of nature related to this first and second nature idea. Bible believers doesn't seem like the kind of thing I'm looking for. Hierarchy in nature.
Yeah, so anyway, I've got uh, I've got materials from the ISC um, somewhere somewhere around here. So who am I reading here? Who are you reviewing? I think it's uh <laughs> it's always good to just get a look. Anyway. The last example of a rabbit hole on Murray Bookchin was the anti well the yeah, the anti Zionist thing. Um What who are you are you you are reading? 26 graduate student from Prescott College, an actual scientist. All right. A mushroom hunter. Okay, this is definitely a person worth reading. Here we go. <laughs> That's how you check it out. That's how you vet people. All right. So, Bookchin's first and second nature. Well, anyway, oh, yeah, there are quotes here. This is good. First nature is just what you and I would refer to as nature, the natural ecological world subject to the forces of evolution, competition, etc. Second nature is a bit more trickly, but tricky, but is essentially the natural world as expressed through modern human society. It's our idea of nature. Bookchin argues for the uniqueness of humans, despite what deep ecology might say. Animals do not create a second nature that embodies a cultural tradition, nor do they possess a complex language, elaborate conceptual powers, or an impressive capacity to restructure their environment purposely according to their own needs. So that's citing the, the Bookchin reader, but that's going to be a... An, a, a um, a, a compendium of, uh, well, being a reader, it's a compendium. So, yeah, um, I, I don't necessarily have the, the actual source essay, but I think that's maybe what I, right. Okay, let's keep reading this. This dual nature concept creates the gap Bookchin needs to further assert that there has been a break between the two natures, which has allowed humanity to view nature as submissive and malleable, hence our current environmental plight. This thinker, this, this student, says, I would argue, however, that whatever break there has been is a technological innovation, not cultural breakdown. Not nearly as decisive. All right, so this person might have some, yeah, liberal tendencies and um, doesn't want to think of it from a perspective of systemic criticisms, but the idea that technology is driving things is a very popular way that people go, who's driving this machine? You know, it's all just, it's all just technologies. Uh, it's all just technologies. propagating in time. All right, well, I should probably read more book chin. This is, uh, but yeah, that, 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 that at least, well, there, there was a quote there. Uh, Yeah, might be done diving through that stuff. Oh, so a quote from the Ecology of Freedom, what we were just looking at. The notion of animal hierarchies has a checkered history. Blah, blah, blah. All right, I'm not necessarily going to follow down that. 
rabbit hole? What's this? What's this rabbit hole I like to? Aw, look at this clip from Ur Ursula K. Like in, I'm not on a first name basis, I shouldn't just call her Ursula K. The great Ursula K. Lagoon. Book Chin was a true son of the Enlightenment in his respect for clear thought and moral responsibility, in his honest, uncompromising search for a realistic hope. Aw, what a nice thing to say. This looks like an interesting uh, website, Resilience. This is auto playing something. So that's a minus. I don't think you have to listen to it. Where are you? I can't stop this player. I'm gonna have to kill the page. That's obnoxious. All right. Yeah, again, this this is a doer. This person was organizing constantly and revising his thinking publicly constantly because he was interested in contributing to this ecosystem. So yeah, abandoned the Arnicus label was, was definitely um, <clears throat> right, like a, a significant significant rupture. At least by 1995. And by 2002, he put that online that he didn't consider himself uh, an anarchist anymore. Post-scarcity is potentially liberatory to the extent that human culture, that education itself can help us overcome some of the limitations, the habits that are miring us down in unconstructive relationships with each other, with ourselves. It doesn't need to be controlled and, and commodified. We don't need to create scarcity. We can find ways to communicate the abundance of a beautiful information about, about the world. We can find ways to tap into that abundance. All right, Janet Beals, an authority on Book Chin, can read about his break from anarchism, but I was already aware of that, I guess. Book Chin began warning humanity about the disastrous environmental impact its activities had, but unlike various mystics and primitivists who blamed human nature as such, he noted that 
It was the only way human societies are organized. It was the way human societies are organized that determines humanity's attitude towards nature. Again, researching alternative forms of social organization that could pave the way towards an ecological society. So it's the... You could say it's the colonizing program. It's within the, co the colonial framework still. Looking for forms of social organization that could pave the way towards an ecological society. So it does presuppose that it's not already out there necessarily. But this idea that there's a direct link between social organization and how humans interact with nature. This is beautiful to me and resonant and true. It seems like something obvious but it needs to be said. It's that, that intuition that the way that we exploit ourselves and, and each other, that they're related. <clears throat> right and I won't get into like the actual newer developments because like a, a program for actually transforming society uh, a what to do, an actual answer to the question what to do. It's it's so so meaty that like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna even pretend to it's not it's not appropriate for me to just discuss it this way. Um because I I'm humbled by the 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 um follow through in a person that actually built um um a program. For, for what to do for us to take take back um, our societies from a, a practical um, perspective uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to direct my effort besides looking into a camera streaming on the internet um, and some of these maybe will come more to the foreground in this movement organizing uh, time slot where uh, I really am trying to integrate um, all these different aspects of myself. But for now, there's a whole community of people that call themselves Feldenkrais practitioners or somatic educators of various schools like Bartinia Fundamentals or HANA Somatics, some of the predecessor things like Alexander Technique. Body Mind Centering, also currently being included as a somatic education modality. There's a large, fairly large number of people that are preoccupied with communicating about natural phenomena, the actual human condition. Those are the people that are kind of in my lane. And when I'm speaking as a student of Moshe Feldenkrais and a student of the natural sciences, I'm, I'm holding a little bit of ownership of these traditions. 
not possessive ownership, but custodianship, you could say, of these traditions. But the only reason why these vocations exist is that there's a need. And if we individualize and medicalize the need, then we can serve it through a series of market-oriented transactions, and we can make a living. We can get paid to do the work of teaching people. And my contention is that if that's all we do, and if we do it mindlessly, then it's very unclear how it leads to the kind of progress that leads to the kind of pervasive thriving that should be the goal of a person that wants justice in this world, not just their own thriving. And so this organization of ourselves into competitive units, individuals that are all pursuing their own agenda, uniformity only happening under coercive power, under the control of brand marks or control of access to certain forums. Gatekeeping and rent collecting. Gatekeeping and rent collecting can't be seen as congruent with spreading knowledge, liberatory knowledge of the human situation. Maybe a person needs to work as a prison guard to make a living. Maybe that is the situation that they're in. But one shouldn't be confused that when they work as a prison guard, that they are working as a prison guard. Maybe the prisoners can teach each other liberation, but I don't think it's coming from the prison guard. So, holding some pieces, the uh, domination, according to Murray Bookchin, the domination of the natural domination of people by each other. I'll just leave it like that. <clears throat> the domination of each other as people is rooted in the hierarchical relationships of humanity to the natural world itself. And although Bookchin holds on to the uniqueness of humans in the, in the natural world as special animals, and not just simply animals, as the deep ecologists would say, um, Bookchin is uh, nonetheless... Um, clear that there is the actual nature, the actual natural world, which we are part of inexorably and indistinguishably, the first nature. And then there's the second nature, the cultural relationship to that, that humans have, have created for themselves. 
and that the nature of second nature is in a sense the difference between all these different human cultures, the essential characteristics that define why some modes of human relation to their surroundings seem to be sustainable and harmonious, and some modes of engagement with the surroundings, some way of relating to the world seem to be counterproductive and extractive. Um, they can be they can be distinguished. It's funny what constitutes a health problem. Even the simplest things like basic physiology, if there's something which isn't going right and you've got a support, you've got a source of that nutrient that you can't synthesize, or you've got um, a way to filter the blood because your kidneys can't do it, or to oxygenate the blood because the lungs can't do it. If you do have a gizmo for replacing those things, then you're still healthy, or you're still the homeostasis, homeostatic condition is fulfilled, whatever. It seems like the actual definition of health, um, just like the definition of living or dying, um, if not properly fleshed out, leads to all kinds of complicated ideas that probably justify some complicated relationships to the truth or to reality that might not actually be very useful that may not be correct. A lot of today's train of thought was inspired by this essay I'm, I'm, I'm developing on related to the, the two natures, Bookchin's ideas there. And 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 my work in in somatics. But also today I saw um, I was reminded of Dan Siegel, um, a, psych, a psychiatrist um, with a an undergrad in biochem, like my like my undergrad, although I did a lot of biochem um, after my undergrad. And Dan Siegel proceeded to do a lot of clinical work. Although they're known to me and to the Feldenkrais community as um, some great explainer of um, sociobiology or interpersonal socio sociobiology, I think is the... the subfield, um, to quote Dan Siegel, that puts together all the fields of science. Um, and and I have a lot of compassion for people that are so needing of clear explanations for what's happening in psychiatry and in clinical clinical psychiatry um, that they are constantly trying to evaluate what neuroscience says or what the various fields of science say um, and put it together in a way that is coherent in a way that lets them 
help people in a, in a reliable way. Um, so, so much gratitude for people that try to do work like that. Um, and, and boy, are there like, is it, is it ever dissociative listening to this person? The, um, amount of talking about the, the brain and nervous system, um, as a, um, as an entity and the, the, I really think this person thinks that having all this visualization of neuroanatomy um, or clarity of how feelings are embodied through anatomical structures, uh, even that sentence doesn't really make sense to me. Feelings are embodied through anatomic, like how feelings happen. Uh, like, thank God we don't need to think about nervous systems in order to get in touch with ourselves. Go ahead. If you're tuning in, there was a lot of disconnected uh, um, rambling <coughs> survey of Murray Bookchin and things connected to Murray Bookchin on the internet, including a, a screed that lambasts him as a as a dupe, as a Zionist dupe. Um, and not an anarchist hero. Although Bookchin says that Bookchin's not an anarchist at all. Uh, so yeah, a lot of randomly connected things there. And I was just interested in clarifying the two natures idea, which I guess I didn't ever track down the, the primary, the primary source. I think it's probably those materials from the ISC that I mentioned, um, of two natures. The idea that there is the natural world, and then everything in the natural world is part of the natural world. And so everything that we call artificial is also part of the natural world. There is one nature. And then second nature is our understanding of nature. When I say that there is one nature, that is but one way of relating to it. That is my way of relating to it. I think it's the valid frame of reference for people that are working in a naturalistic perspective. If you if you think that you're working consistently with the natural sciences and, and that the worldview, that there is a, a world out there that isn't just... Um, um, a fiction, a creation of, of yourself. That there is a world independently of you that exists according to its own rules. Um, that perspective. That perspective doesn't have mind in it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for psychiatrists that work so hard to help people and their troubled minds. But there aren't minds in first nature. They're not going to be there. Minds are part of second nature. And so there's a neurology, there's a, a logical systematics, there's an ology of the nervous system. But psychology, 
where that winds up in, in the natural world, worldview, where that discipline actually lands, it's going to be in the cultural area. It's going to be in something, a discipline that examines our second nature, our, our relationship to this phenomena called experience. This phenomenon we call being alive. Alive as you are. Because that's the thing, being a human. Because you can hear these words and understand them, I know that you're a person over there. That we're sharing something. that our language is connecting us in a deep way. Thank you for spending some time. Thank you for attending to all the important relationships in your world. And next week, continuing Tuesdays in the movement structure time slot, where it's basically bi biology review time for me. Um, although it can be more interactive uh, in theory. And if somebody had detailed questions on the anatomy of uh, various pandemic virus proteins. Uh, I could talk about it in that time slot. Uh, but not here, trying to be more holistic and integrative in the organizing slot um, on Thursdays. Um, so 